Everybody, it's time for the PPL. Week three back here with Pretty Hair and I Hold Shift. We've got a hot North American lineup for you guys. Hey, what's so funny? Nothing. That's how I always open the desk. Always, 24-7. And I've only ever opened the desk like once. Actually, this is probably the first time I've ever so opened the desk. So you're actually not wrong. You actually so this always... Is, this is standard issue. This is 100% like of the it. time. I don't know why I'm laughing. It's, I'm very serious about this. Very, very good stuff here so far on the desk. And that's what you're in store for today. That's what you're in store for in November as well as we move towards DreamHack HRX this year. Taking place in a little bit of a different flavor of a venue. But you'll still know and love all the same tournaments. SWC, PWC, Console Smite World Championship as well as the Paladins Console Wars. Those tickets are available now on HiResExpo.com, and that event takes place November 16th through the 18th. But that's actually going to be a kind of a rather long tournament this year with, with placement rounds, oh, yeah. things like that for a couple of weeks leading up to it. It's time it to get, though, to the info for today, guys. North America it is the day. We're here in the summer split of the PPL. Here's some info on some of the other series we do, console series, global series, PPL. That's what you're watching right now, five teams. May 29th through the June 20th. We are in the third week of this best of five double round robin format. And we'll head to the schedule now to talk a little bit about what you're going to see today. Of course, we are on Wednesday. Earlier today, you saw OCN and North American best of five PGS, the P or Paladins Global Series. Now we're going to get into our two North American matchups for the day. We've still got, of course, two more, but that's on Friday. Europe will be tomorrow, so on and so forth throughout the week. Today, we've got double header for a little team named Splice. Just a little team named Splice. <laughs> Just a little one. No, I mean, this has been a, you know, a really interesting topic of conversation with, of course, Ozone having you know recently yeah. uh, taken himself away from the team because of, you know, obviously his real-life obligations. But that was a player that, in my eyes, I was thinking that this guy's going to change the way the PPL feels just because of his grind, his passion, and his knowledge of the game. And now that he's not there, it's going to be really interesting to see how Splice turns around so quickly and tries to adjust to get themselves in the running for any of these summer finals that are coming up. They have matchups where they really need to prove themselves. Again, right. the one versus Renegades from week one went all the way to five in one of the more entertaining sets, I, th I would say, of the PPL in total. And yeah. now how can they come back and possibly find their win today? I'm going to miss Ozone. I mean, he, he, he had a great story, right? Starting from the bottom, you know, ex-Overwatch player streaming, trying out this game, Paladins for the first time, getting a little bit more traction, building up steam. Then he's in the PGS, swapping teams all around, starting to win the PGS. Yeah. Now, finally, he's in the PPL. We get to see what he can do. And, you know, I think it, the decision that he made, I talked about this, I think, on Esports Weekly, but I have a lot of respect for it because Absolutely. I know how hard that must have been for him given how much work he put in. And I think overall, I think we will miss him, but definitely want to give that guy all the respect he deserves today. Splice, they've got four other guys and one mystery man. I'm not sure who's filling in for him today uh, that are going to be playing up against the Renegades uh, and up against, uh, I believe, G2 today. Yeah. So we'll have to see how they end up working that one out. Splice. They have, uh, of course, Vayne on that roster that can maybe saddle a little bit. Someone's got to step up, be that leader. I think Ozone did a lot uh, as a leader. He was a very vocal guy, right? Set up a lot of teams. I think knew what it may or what made or break a team uh, in terms of the dynamic. I think so as well. And the logical sense would be G Bunny possibly filling it since he was that other guy that was on Toxicity's roster uh, through the end of that PGS run that that squad had. And Vayne, I think you know, as you take a look, because Ozone obviously was their big damage player that they were looking at as far as carrying the load. I wouldn't be surprised to see Vayne maybe flexing a little bit more onto that damage because previous to his frontline tenure, he was actually playing some pretty solid, uh, consistent damage game so I'm really interested to see what impact he has I think that this is the guy that's going to have to step up with Ozone right. being gone as possibly being that next big voice on the team and you've got you know guys with that PPL experience on, on this roster just a little bit just a hair of right. PPL experience in vain so maybe he is one of those guys that steps up and becomes a leader for this team however their opponents today Renegades have been picking up a lot of steam as of late I think and with the addition of Moon Shopper another sort of ex PPO player, if you want to call him that. He played for Splice uh, in the previous season, and they're doing fairly well with him now. We did a little quick interview with, uh, frankly, one of the most well-spoken players in the league and definitely on Renegade. So let's take a listen. Hey, everybody. Latigris here with Moonchopper from Renegades to talk about the game before we head on into it. So first of all, Moonchopper, how you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. Of course, of course. Now, you're facing off against Splice for this week, and you've already faced off against them once before. So, generally speaking, how were you feeling after that first match? Uh, honestly, I was. there's always, like, first-time jitters, correct? 
Um, but next time, like, it always gets easier and easier, and you kind of just get more relaxed as time goes on. Like, especially for me, just joining Renegades, like, especially with, like, this uh, short of an off-season, there is a lot of, uh, like, things you would want to do more with the team, like build more synergy and whatnot. But, you know, it felt pretty good. I know when you were on Splice, you had conversations with Pretty Hair about how hungry you were for a victory. And now on Renegades, where it's a bit different position for the team. So how are they helping you feed into that competitive spirit? Um, Honestly, it feels really great to play on Renegades. Um, I know like two of the members there quite well because I used to play with them in the PGS, uh, including being good friends with Loki and Kliku. And so it just feels really great and feels like a home that you never knew about being on Renegades, to be honest. It just, it makes me more confident and more comfortable, especially being with them and knowing like, and trusting them. Like that's a big thing is the trust. Mm -hmm. And Loki and Click you, a lot of people have made the speculation these are the veterans on the team, so they have some level of leadership. Is that the case when you are playing in-game, or is it kind of equal footing for everybody as far as input? Um, Kliku and Loki do a lot. They really do. But everyone puts in their input, and everyone does have a word. Um, because in the end of the day, sometimes things don't work out from your own perspective, and if you don't speak out, then who's going to know, right? If I push one side and it's not working for me, then I need some help or something, then I'll say it. The same thing goes for everybody else. Sometimes people have really good ideas that they chime in because you can't keep doing the same thing over and over again. It's really nice having uh, people that you can rely on, though, because Kliku and Loki do a lot of the calming work as well. And I'm not used to that, actually, from being on Splice beforehand. It's got to so, be a nice yeah. adjustment then, having that kind yeah. of just stability within the team. And you're facing off against Splice for the second time within this split. And it was a victory the first time, but they've been showing some prowess within their play. So what are some of the things that you're keeping at the forefront of your mind in this rematch? Um, honestly, uh, I think the best bet for us, like, uh, losing to Splice was the first week, in my opinion, just because, like, I only had, like, three or a couple of days with Renegades before playing. Uh, so it was really like quite an adjustment coming from Splice and not doing like just scrimming or ringing or practicing whatever without a team for a little bit uh, before the season started again. So going into this next game with Splice, I feel like really confident, not gonna lie. I'm really comfortable with the team. I feel like everything that I wanted to do the first week that we couldn't get to do, we did during these couple of weeks, so. Cool. My last question for you is if Renegades makes it to the LAN, will you provide some of the yummy food that we're always seeing on social media? Is there any chance we'll get to taste it? Well, yeah. I mean, last time at HRX, I did cook for people. I made burgers, but um, yeah, definitely. All right. Well, that's one thing that I want to know for sure. Thanks for joining me, Moon Chopper, and we'll see how you do in the game. Thank you. Thank you. Chef Choppa, open for business. Put uh, put Alan and I down for uh, yeah, a table sign me of up. two whenever you are opening the doors. <laughs> Any and, intimate uh, location with candlelight preferred. <laughs> God bless. <laughs> <laughs> and you were right. Uh, hit the nail on the head there. G Bunny, uh, former member for Toxicity, will be filling in. And uh, do you think that dynamic will maybe help them try and keep up some of this momentum that they've had? I think, you know, it's not going to be unfamiliar. That's the best thing, I think, with Splice, with taking that full toxicity roster and just saying, all right, all of you guys are now Splice. G-Bunny fitting in. He's got the experience. He's subbed in before. I mean, there was that period of time where Ozone was going through, again, other real-life obligations during that PGS yeah. time before they were just barely not able to qualify. And G-Bunny played through a lot of that. So he definitely has the experience. He definitely has the exposure to get himself out there and play against these squads. The big question mark for me is just who's going to be able to take over Ozone's IGL calling and his damage output. Right. That's the biggest question mark for me as we look at this matchup. Oh, only one way to find out, and that's to get this set started. Let's head to the map. Remember, this is a best of five. Two maps are banned out. High seed picks first. Lower seed will pick next. And then from there on, it's just loser's pick. Actually, it's probably, I guess, coin flip since there's technically no higher seeds yet. It's not a tournament. So we'll head into draft, get this one underway for you. Renegades, first pick up on the board. They're going to take off the Drogos. For Frog Isle. It's interesting to see it so soon. Right. Um, and 
I mean, again, everyone's looked at Drogos as being that that big, versatile character now, yeah. especially with that fuselade able to hit a more consistently with the projectile speed increase. Drogos can have a very devastating impact. Of course, not really surprising to see the Khan or the Makoa taken away. And I think that with the Drogos being gone, you're going to be seeing more instances of that Terminus being a priority perchance. Only a couple of big boys left on the board here. I've noticed specifically uh, Inara dropping far, far lower in the draft. Which is surprising. Here. Cassie, Genos will go for Splice. Buck has not been in love with uh, any North American Buck, to be quite honest with you. Uh, but I think if anyone's close, it's probably the Renegades. Getting Genos away from Buck is, is always something you want to prioritize heavily here. It seems strange to take the Buck first before you have the Genos online. I mean, you don't normally see Buck right. as being such a high priority. So it's just interesting to see again, that was the big talking point yesterday with EU was, can you get these flankers online? Can they have that playmaking influence that you want to see? Buck would just, again, without that Genos damage boost from Luminary, will not be able to have as much of an impact, but obviously still that ability to go over and under walls is going to be really huge, I think. I feel like it's probably just to try and deter one of the snipers with two of them open though it, it's a bit of a tall task to do and uh, both snipers will be taken here hmm. either team having one sported i think it's really just for my money if you look at the flanking lineup buck is, is sometimes really the only one that i like on frog io i feel like you know zin's obviously top tier flanker mave can be as well I was about to say Eevee is my pick for best flanker on Frog Isle, personally. Yeah, but having to burn so many cooldowns, I think, for, I, I, I guess I'm thinking more of Zin specifically. Having to burn cooldowns to, to, to get across certain gaps, right, when you've got Zin, and Billow is such a long cooldown, right. whereas Buck can just, you know, punch his way anywhere he <laughs> needs to go. Eevee, definitely the same conversation there, but... Not a lot of North American Eevees operating at a high level. No, definitely not. And as you take a look, it's going to be the Eevee versus Buck conversation for me and the Strix versus Kinesa conversation for me. And off the bat, if you were to put favor somewhere, I like both Strix and Eevee over Buck and Kinesa. So we'll see if it performs. Well, that's a fun topic. That's a fun conversation. Let's have it. Gabby and Gore, take us away for game one. Hey, everyone. Latigris and Gormizer here for game number one. And the desk got it right, looking at the Buck versus the Eevee and then the Knessa versus the Strix. I'm kind of curious to see it because I feel like, again, Strix usually gets that upper hand against Knessa just because the stealth peak, you always tend to get that first shot. But Eagle Eye changes that equation when you hit that headshot. So it's really up to kind of, I mean, mechanical skill from the players. And there's certain ways that you can kind of just edit your loadout on Knessa, try and close a little bit of that gap in that utility. But it's Renegades versus Splice. Splice still looking to try and get a win, but they did have a roster change that might make that a bit difficult. That, I think, is the big thing. The spotlight is on Splice today because they have been performing pretty well despite their win-loss record, not having a win just yet. I would say being able to go to two five-game sets in the first week, being keeping it close against a lot of these top teams in North America, it makes it something worth looking into. But not having Ozone, someone who is notably very flexible, but swapping it out for G-Bunny, who can be a very standard frontline, which allows the rest of the team to maybe kind of flex around him. And that's the thing. When you're bringing a new player and you're already trying to d adapt in that aspect, you need to get them on something that's comfortable, and he has a lot of frontliner experience. Ooh. Nice shot immediately onto Kinesa, who has to dip behind the wall, shoots a little bit of the shield off of Nando as he tries to make his rotation up the side stairwell. Moonchopper coming up as well, but not a lot of aggression, depending on Eevee here, is going to make the big difference. Did fall down, but I believe was able to soar right back up onto the map. Dangerous positioning, but you're still able to come through. The main fight has been the front lines. G-Bunny forced to fall back as Heroes just standing on the point. Yeah, Splice, it looks kind of like a chicken coop situation with Renegades collapsing from both angles. And here's some lockdown onto Terminus as you do have to eventually try and stem the 72% achieved by Renegades as it's a battle rock on rock. And this is just going to be the big issue, especially now Loki being able to get rid of Vayne. The passive healing that G-Bunny would have had from that Genos is now no longer there. Trying to take this fight, especially in the Warder's field, you're just going to end up losing that one. Hero finally kills him off and now is at 99%. And that overtime going courtesy of that death, but it looks like it is trickling on down nicely. Renegades capturing the first point. And one thing as well, because G-Bunny is on the Terminus, you see some switcheroos of just the roles in general. Yeah. Vayne is on the Genos right now, and 
something like that could work and maybe you find something that clicks or it's just another challenge that you have to face against a team you've already had a lot of difficulty with. It really does open up the discussion I think we've had over the past couple of weeks where it's just like, you know, double frontline versus three DPS. Which one do you really want to kind of run? And I feel like for certain teams, the answer needs, seems to be a little bit more clear. Fnatic, more often than not, they're going to go for the three DPS, but they can flex on the double frontline. Some teams don't have that same flexibility. Sometimes you will have a player who is just very adept at the one role. That seems to be kind of G-Bunny comes in. He's a really good frontline player. We have to put him there. But it seems weird to pull Vayne away from that kind of role. And all eyes in some ways are on Aspect to try and actually step up with this EV play. As Nick mentioned on the desk, there haven't been really any North American EV players that have managed to match up with players like Pacheco. And in this, you need that to be able to lock down on Moonchopper, who is on the buck that's been rising in popularity once again. Viral here, just supplying what he needs to for the rest of the team. Renegades, it's been not a big bloody battle or anything. That's yeah. what's crazy about it. They're just steadily moving forward. There's a lot of poke, but it's a lot of control really coming down. Hero has been the most aggressive. Clicky Moonchopper finally being able to pick up a couple kills. Three down for Splice as they start moving this payload forward. But I feel like Hero, like, he just walks forward. Like, he wasn't on the payload for a while there. He was just getting in the face of Splice, making them fight. And I think Splice realized right now that it's very unlikely for them to be able to get this because there was no reanimate that came back and Renegades get the clean 2-0. And honestly, I kind of like that call. You have 2% left till you get your flashbang from Strix. Every other ult on your team is available. Reanimate is huge for being able to take a point, especially when you have comeback mechanics. So this is a good area for Splice to be in to try and not only tie the game up, but maybe swing some of that confidence back in their favor because they only got two kills that entire round. Granted, there weren't a lot of kills all around, but only picking up two is definitely going to be a little bit more rough. Yeah, it was so quiet for parts of it where they just... <laughs> Moved on, they did their thing, and I think Splice recognizing the limitations Five, in that final four, portion because so many of three, them were by their two, spawning area. One. And now Renegades, clearly with the credit advantage, working into some further itemization as they go into round two on Frog Isle. I'm going to take a really weird analogy for this one. It feels kind of like Renegades, in this instance, are kind of like Bob Ross Ooh. painting. You have some mistakes that happen, some accidents that come through. Loki dying is definitely not something you plan for, but you still can usually shape this to your favor. You lose Moon Chopper, you kill off Shadow, but you have lost three key members. And with comeback mechanic, that's what Spice needs. Yeah, that was just a really good way to start off that fight, using through time and space to clip exactly where Loki was standing. 66% still climbing for Splice as Renegades do spawn back up. Ultimates that they have online as well if they decide to use them. And I think Moonchopper, he's trying to make his rotation towards the objective. Can he step in time? 99% overtime does settle as a Dread Serpent has been activated by Renegades. Maybe the opportunity to turn this tie. But Shadow and Ricotta both picking up kills. Shadow taking this really nice angle from the side. Clicky's shield doing as much as he can. Eats the reanimate so there's not any damage. But Shadow gets rid of the kill. Ricotta's gone, but this is all on Cassie right now. No one's taking him down. A beautiful wall from here keeps him going for a little bit longer. But the problem is, is that you're just trading one body in for another. Moonchopper jumps in goes down and they lose the point as much of sustain as is available to this buck eventually if your collapse there on the point it does go down so splice take full advantage and it's their turn to push after that capture but it was very much a situation of really good aggressiveness at the beginning of the round with comeback mechanic in their favor that allowed them to complete so far Strix I want to say both snipers have been kind of quiet, except for the fact <laughs> Loki right there takes a mean headshot and that kind of not Whoa. takes him out of the equation, but makes it a little bit more troublesome as oh. of right now. That damage from Ricotta can be so deadly. But right now, right Click U is able to take him out. That's the thing. Loki was so far off that it was a beautiful headshot and he got chunked down low. He had to back off, but was in a safe position to actually find, well, that safety. As Renegades hold on this defense, 50% of that push, but it is on the decline. Loki reigning in, trying to take down this Terminus, or at least scare him. In this weird area, I want to say it almost feels kind of like awkward for Renegades because they're like, we know we can win these fights when we take them appropriately. We just went a little bit too hard. We went out of position. Specifically, I want to say again, Moonchopper got a little aggressive and ends up falling early. And then there's the follow-up of, oh, we have to replace it or make that death worthwhile. Sometimes if someone dies, you just have to let them die. But there is an Ice Storm attempt from Splice to try and get the lockdown. Did get some damage onto Renegades, but not enough to kill them off. Clicky throws it back onto Aspect, sends him to the Grage. A follow-up as Ricotta joins him there. 
And we're in the final minute of this potential push as the ultimates for Renegades are looking mighty fine, basically all of them up to full. G Bunny looking to try and heal up everyone on Splice, trying to figure out how to get back in here. And honestly, that Terminus is probably the biggest key to just getting any pressure back. But the problem is, is that no reanimate doesn't really have the charge up to get it back soon enough. So this is looking like a round where honestly Splice kind of want to cap off those ultimates, get them back as fast as possible. If you can push, you can, or you can try, but it's in that awkward area where honestly you want to try and figure out a good way to just slow the roll from Renegades. If you're going to take any moment for aggression, now would be the time, but they lose Vayne, so they lose that sustain, and Loki is taken to this angle once more, and right immediately following that splice, they do back up a tad, because that's not a fight that you want to take if you don't have somebody that's actually able to heal you up. You know, I really like being able to watch Loki for that angle, specifically because he was waiting to snipe an Eevee. You could see he was hovering way above headshot range for anyone walking up that ramp. That's because he was waiting for someone to blink forward and try to find the hit there. And it's just nice. one of those things that if you can find hits like that, you could make the big difference. This is gorgeous for how that goes. That is very oh. far back, and his leg got clipped. Oh. <laughs> like, Kinesa's pinky toe happened to be in that, but Genos... I mean, I, I guess if you channel, you know, time and space, no matter where you hit, it's going to kill someone. Oh, that was so Point far. That was seconds. so far. So beautiful. Where I imagine there was a bit of disorientation on the side of Loki. And just the snowball effect immediately oh, after God. Splice was able Four. to follow up for that Three. point. But nonetheless, Two. Renegades are one. up 3-1. to one. Still comeback mechanic for Splice. And you see the Tier 3 rejuvenate over for G-Bunny on the Terminus. So he can attempt to contest this point as much as possible. Big question for me is, what are the odds Vayne hits another snipe like that? It's coming through. It does connect that time, but it doesn't find the kill. Ricotta is the one who ends up cleaning a little bit more damage right there. And without Loki, again, that's a huge presence off the board. Uh, and there's a Dread Serpent from Renegades. Manages to add some separation to Splice, but they have chosen to position themselves much more aggressively than they have in times past. Moon Chopper eliminated by G-Bunny, who just swings away with the axe. Now it's time to set back towards the objective. Click you activating this immortal. Keeps himself alive in the meantime at full HP, but Splice all the while capture. Comeback mechanic. And again, all you need for these fights. And this is something I think we see pretty much through all levels of play. All you need to win a comeback mechanic is one good fight. And then you can sit on the point and you're usually going to be able to get it. Unless things go really bad for you during that fight, you lose three or four members. Most of the time, the other team isn't going to be able to get back in time. And it gives you a little bit more momentum. Now you've captured two points. You have more credits overall in your pocket. And because of that, you can get aggressive. You can find some of these really nice shots. A lot better follow-up this time from Splice immediately on this push. And Ricotta, last time he maybe got one kill, maybe a shot before he was taken down. This time, there is no pressure. G-Bunny is so aggressively positioned outside of these spawn doors. And then Eevee is on the opposite end, though takes quite a bit of damage. And if they don't get to safety, they'll die. But luckily for Splice, Aspect makes it. Now Hero looking to try and take the brunt of the damage again. Now you're just looking for a body to try and stop this payload from moving forward. Chase down, get rid of G-Bunny. As of right now, it doesn't look like there's going to be any reanimate. Hero and Loki both getting some kills there. Again, just stalling it. But a minute and 20 on Frog Isle with where this payload is. The hardest part is going to be getting back to the payload safely. Splice do have a lot of time to do so, but they Ooh. do have to find that opening. And Loki wants to shut every door possible. Holding these cute little angles. And I think it's funny to see where things have gone because, you know, with Strix and Kinesa both having the scope increase, it feels like Loki is taking that more to heart and playing a lot further back, using that increased zoom to kind of keep himself distant so he's not anywhere near as much danger from the flanks. Whereas you still see Ricotta getting aggressive, kind of getting up in your face and just having a much better chance at hitting maybe some of the headshots because of how zoomed in he is. And we have seen Strix players try to do this and more for the use of switching off to the pistol if need be. But Ricotta in a similar place that he did earlier within this actual push where he got a lot of that pressure that allowed G-Bunny to venture forward. A nice shot onto Moon Chopper who has to rotate behind the wall on the opposite hazard zone end. And two actually on the side of Renegades getting chunked down. Here was in a little bit of trouble. Click is getting low. Ricotta though in this awkward angle where he's going to go face to face with a buck. Although Moon Chopper's not going to walk away with any kills. He falls back. Focus the objective. Try to kill off G-Bunny. Get away the presence from the payload. And G-Bunny is sandwiched between two of the members of Renegades right now. 
And he does have reanimate if need be. Ends up falling to the wayside. Overtime sets on in. Hero standing strong. Actually gets a last hit onto Aspect. Aspect and the Cassie are both eliminated for the time being. And Splice, they lose another one, another one. And with that, it's going to be a defense for Renegades. Though they don't get the point, but it's still a good hold. That felt kind of as though there was, I want to say, miscommunication between Splice. Jeez. Where it was just in that area of... We don't want to use reanimate, but we don't want to back off. And it felt like when you don't want to use reanimate in that scenario, the call should be back off. Like, we're not going to take it. Throwing the four other bodies we have at the payload is not going to make a difference if we don't have the front line. We're just feeding credits into it as it is right now. There are two people with 666 slash lines in this game. Oh. Hmm. What does that say about this game? Oh, some evil Bruin. Five. Four, I don't know where to go three, with it. I feel like there's probably like a several jokes, but my brain is just blanking on them. <laughs> so focused on the gameplay. <laughs> What's going on well, here? I'm still, I'm personally still trying to figure out where, where exactly I rank like this splice versus them with Ozone. It's kind of in this area where I'm not quite sure where they feel yet, but they're doing a good job against Renegade so far this game. Another through time and space. This time, I'm not going to find anywhere near, I want to say, as much value as the last couple rounds. And no one stepped onto the objective yet. Hero might be the first one to do so once he tops himself off in HP. But Splice are actually just waiting for their in and using some of these ultimates early on within the round. But the ones that you can afford to either whiff or aren't going to be game changing, holding on to, obviously, the reanimate should come into effect later. But here's the headhunter from Loki. Gets a smack onto Vayne. Take out that sustain, baby. And Renegade sent Hero to the objective. Terminus is there to match and see if he can actually get enough contest with Splice. They're just losing a member here and there. And I love the way they played that. Just get a little aggressive, get the kills you need, and then fall back. Let Moonchopper take the aggression away. He's going to be able to find G-Bunny, find Aspect. And now they're starting to press the gas pedal. Renegades are getting onto the point. They're holding onto it. And G-Bunny, at this point, Uses the reanimate, not going to have it again. Everyone's putting in their work. I like the way Renegades waited for their rotation because now Hero with Viral just standing so close on by to constantly apply those heals isn't having any issue with this capture. Splice is so far backed up right now. Moon Chopper is there with Click You just in case they need to infiltrate this back line. But it may not even be too necessary. They have to rotate back towards the objective where G-Bunny is facing off against Hero. Right now, it's just Ooh. not going to be enough. Another headshot right there at the end for Moon Chopper as they're getting aggressive. Ice Storm onto him, but overtime is taken down. Evie has to get in there, but she can't. On Renegades, take game number one. Nobody from Splice in those final moments able to touch, but this was a game in the favor of Red. I will say, I'm... Happy to see that Splice doesn't seem as set back as I thought they would be. That was one of the things I was kind of worried about coming into this, was seeing the way that they were doing weeks one and two. It was going really well for them, to the point where I didn't know if they'd find like the first win this week, but that they'd definitely be able to make it a lot closer. And being able to see that it might not be as close as it could have been, it's still a very close set. And with this Team Comp, you're having G-Bunny still able to be on picks that they're very comfortable yeah. with. So it's not as jarring of a change if you're willing to flex some of your other players. But Renegades, they've been working hard, especially since the Moon Chopper pickup, to try and really prove themselves as one of the top in the region. And it's feeling comfortable. Everything looking pretty seamless at this point. It was one of the things he had mentioned in the Esports Weekly, where it's just like, when he comes in, the first time, they didn't have a lot of playtime together, so that first week was probably their roughest for him. And then he said, now it feels just like being at home. Everything feels right about the team. They're working well together. There's still some of those split-second decisions towards the end, like in the 3-3 scenarios. Do you get aggressive? Do you stay passive? You can't do too much of either. And I feel like they've kind of hit that stride finally. So that was game number one. Dusk, I want to know, what did you think of Splice since this change in their roster? Well, I think great moments uh, from both teams. Certainly, uh, I'm surprised at what I saw from Splice, but not so much surprised at, at the guys who were doing it. I think great moments from the man we talked about, you know, Strix and Eevee had pretty good games there for Splice, but I'm going to open the floor to you a little bit. Talk about, you, you were saying, you know, late game itemizations. Why do you think we saw such a strong start from the Renegades and then almost a bell curve where they dipped down in the mid game? It's just the sheer fact that point presence was so much higher for Renegades throughout most of that. G-Bunny, again, is the weak link. He's the newest guy there, and it kind of seemed like, all right, if they're going to run solo front line, let's run a duo right into him, force him to make plays, and to be honest, it just never looked all that comfortable. And Hero, who had top damage on his team as a Nara, 
that's definitely something you don't want to see happen, really for both sides, actually. Money abuse, man. Yeah, and, and, that's, and that's just really smart play from both Hero and Kliku, who were putting the target on the front line, make sure that they win that battle, and it was won most times, uh, flat out. The big struggle, I mean, again, you saw this damage halfway through. Kinesa and Buck were doing nothing that entire game. Strix and Cassie were carrying so hard, but when you have a guy in Aspect who his Twitter avatar is Maldamba, and he's all of a sudden not playing support <laughs> and Vayne is, it kind of makes you wonder, I think, going forward, do you just let Vayne and G-Bunny run double frontline? Obviously, you're going to see Shadow and Rakata still handle the double DPS, put Aspect back on support. I think that's really what you need to take a look at as far as adjustments because the double damage dealing power of Shadow and Rakata together I think is enough to get them through this game versus Renegades. Uh, the front line was their biggest struggle. That's why they lost that game. Yeah, Rakata's, I mean, he, he was insane on the Strix. It, it feels like him scoping in it, it, it's just a formality, really yeah. just to reduce his bloom so he, he knows where the shot's going. He doesn't actually have to look through said scope. He just has to start that animation to get it. I, I don't think I saw him miss a, a single one there. Crazy stuff. 95 FOB, uh, by the way. From the boy, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, man. He, he doesn't seem to be having many problems with it. Let's head to the next map, see where the rest of this set will unfold. It'll be Bright Marsh. So what do you think we'll see in terms of adjustments? Can you afford to run uh, another double front line here? Do you think Splice are going to stick with the solo? I would like to see Splice run double front, let Shadow play something like a Bomb King or Shaolin. He's very, very quick at adjusting targets. He's I remember playing with him back in the day when he first started playing, and I was like, this kid's going to be incredible. I remember watching him play both Bomb King and Shaolin, saying there is hardly anybody that I've seen play more uh, focused than Shadow does. I think he's going to have an opportunity to really shine here. Rakata can obviously pull down a good flank pressure as well, even potentially pulling things like a Zin or an Androxus by chance if necessary. I think you run double damage, double front with a solid support in the middle of your splice. So Buck will be the first pick run back again for the Renegades here. And I agree with you. I felt like there was a lot of moments there where, and objectively speaking as well, where, where Moonchopper's Buck was just above the supports in yeah, damage. Yeah, barely. He wasn't able yeah. to find much damage at all that last game. And it's, it came down to map control on Frog Isle for sure. That, that final last round when he was finally able to get up the enemy staircase for yeah. a change, that's when we saw him actually start to have a presence in the enemy back line. But Renegade's feeling confident enough to run it back. The Cassie, again, is just the burst potential that she brings is really, really strong. The Eevee I'm a little wondering about because, again, you just mentioned those struggles that she did have early where you kind of felt like Eevee was trying to get into the backline and pressuring, but Fernando is really, really good at being able to help out the backline because of that sprint mobility and the long-range fireball. The Ruckus, I actually really like the Ruckus a lot too just because, again, you want that extra damage on point. And, again, that pressure on the G-Bunny. I don't think you can run just solo Terminus into this lineup right now, but they're going to give it a go again. We're going to give it a shot. I don't mind this quite honestly. I think if, not to, to flame G-Bunny here, but he's brand new to this roster. If we are considering him the weak link, I don't mind the fact that they're giving the veterans. I almost look at this like I would look at Kanga, right? When you add like Rhino, he's brand new to the roster, right? I, I say look, you get Joel, Chronic, and Diggy where they need to be to get this game, uh, uh, you know, in the W column for a splice. So... I don't know. We'll have to see if it works out any better. Similar strategies for both squads this time around. Game two, about to come at you. And now heading off to Bright Marsh. And Splice was still able to pull away a couple points, and maybe if they can do that the same here, and they just have a bit more full force in the end. And I think they're going to have a little bit more control on this map, more than they had on Frog Isle. I think Terminus is able to kind of keep a better grip on the point when he moves in there than what you would see on Frog Isle. Very open on Frog Isle, very closed off here. So once he gets in there, you have to come into his range to fight him, or you have to kind of take these awkward angles to try and poke him down, where the rest of his team should admittedly be able to capitalize on your position. But now on the side of Renegades, when they're still just sticking to their guns with a lot of the roles they have everyone playing, Loki is back on the Shaolin, and with Click You and Hero playing this double frontline composition, where Click You is getting to kind of go into that comfort zone as well. And here yeah. we're known to be a really strong frontliner. And Ruckus, it's kind of cool to see him in this game as well. And I really like the way he's trying to change his loadout. What we used to see was a lot of damage reduction. This is a lot of health and survivability. Missile launcher is a focus. Shield is a focus. And then just give me 750 health. That's what I need to stay alive. That's what I need to be able to get in and maybe get some damage down. But unfortunately, he takes the fight in probably an awkward position, gets smacked around by Terminus for a little bit. Early first blood from Moonshopper with Hero's follow-up. 
nine to well 12 to 12 percent as renegades take a bit of control they knew what splice was going to do at the beginning portion of that round and they simply punished them for it terminus waited until he had some of his cooldowns offline and then immediately fired and we've seen this a few times specifically with buck and any other flank really on this map they always end up going around the right side where the staircases are on the docks and whoever wins that flank fight is usually the team that can kind of pull ahead towards the end because now your flank is established your flank is there it can continue pressure in the back line ricotta going to be able to get rid of moon chopper here the question is is it going to be able to displace him in time over time going down the point about to be grabbed yeah it looks like somebody's going to try and make it in for a moment on splice that does reset over time but you see that Leon a little too vulnerable in that moment, and no one can pop out for long enough on Splice before taking too much damage. So overtime still going strong, though, as Renegades attempt to hold. And I love how Splice played that. Even though you lose Leanne, I don't know if you needed to. Eevee Blink definitely could have been able to kind of keep that overtime timer going, but you just hold it long enough for G-Bunny to get back. Now you're looking at the healing, you're looking at trying to figure it out, and G-Bunny is running a little bit of sustain in his own build, so he could stay on here just a little bit longer. He might be able to pull it back, but the problem is taking that fight outside the point. Click you and Hero going down means a big swing for Splice. Yeah, Shadow and Ricotta picking those up off the back of G-Bunny, being able to just forcibly aggressively defend them in this context, passing 90% on the objective. And this is all the time that they needed to get the first point of the game. And I love the way they played it again, just focusing on the side fights. The fights that are not on the point have been what's kind of winning or losing this game for either side. Renegades get a lot of their early pressure just from Moonshopper being there in general. Unfortunately, once they lose him, point swings away for Splice. Now they're in control, and honestly, this is looking pretty crisp from them. Still a lot of time to go on the clock for them to push, and they're just under this archway where sometimes the enemy team is able to apply a bit of pressure. But here's an enlightenment, gets a good chunk onto Hero, but still a beefy boy. He is manages to survive. Dread Serpent from Renegades. Vayne picks one up onto Hero, though, making up for that last bit of damage needed to take down Nando. Coming around 50%, a minute 45 left. And honestly, they're already looking to fight around the last point that I think is going to be very difficult. G-Bunny getting aggressive. A couple swings around here should be able to find some kills if he's lucky, but he gets low, reanimates there, and he's actually immediately going to pop it. Yeah, that was as quick as you can get. A double kill from Shadow to follow up on wow. it as well. What are you going to do if Hero's the only one around? Make that team wipe right now. Quadra kill for Shadow on the Cassie. Oh, my. Walking it in. Is anyone on Renegades going to try to stop it? Moonchopper goes in, Moonchopper goes down. And that payload is converted, and Splice are up 2-0. All right, OK. So taking a look at round number one, what do you think were some of the key elements that Splice brought to the table to be able to make that so convincing? Well, Shadow. Mainly. 6-1-4 yeah. was incredibly good. That quadra was just insane. <laughs> I mean, four kills at any one time is going to be good. And of course, that's where a lot of those kills came from. That entire round turned with Shadow and Aspect picking up a couple kills on the side. Leon going in and then finalizing it. I want to say, again, the point was grabbed by those two. The payload push was grabbed by this. Yeah, that was perfect timing of it and everything. The payload was close yeah. enough where a team wipe they could just make so much effect. And then even Renegades, I think they were having some decision making of their own of, well, how much do we want to actually pour into this after we just got wiped off the map? And with the way things have been going, all you need is Leon and Cassie. And that's one of the things. Cassie is top pick, top contended for a reason. She can do so much to change a game right there. Aspect and be able to get a little bit. They get rid of Ricotta, Vayne, and Bunny. The question is whether or not that's actually going to make a big difference because Shadow and Aspect are still firing. They're holding it all right. And then Moonchopper off the back of that Buckwald early. Got a couple in right now. He's getting another one onto Aspect. So Shadow's taken to this angle, though. Spotted out by Nando. And that's going to be a key. You can't hold those angles for too long when you're at this portion of the fight. And Ricotta in the window side forces Nando off of the objective. Moonchopper half health getting taken down. And this is actually one of the great things about Leon. Bulk up's not going to do too much for you in this matchup. Death and Tax is going to be huge, but a bigger Hexafire going to be able to get rid of Ricotta and again create some space. Eevee, though, still dancing around, causing a lot of trouble. 99% to zero as of right now. Right in the doorway, another Dread Serpent just completely knocks out Aspect to get killed off. Overtime finishes, and this time, Renegades can actually capture after it. 
want to say, again, a little bit of hand in that was comeback mechanic, but a lot of that was proper ult usage. It was not all at once. It was not, hey, we're going to drop three or four at a time. It was, okay, buck wild to start. We're going to win a fight off of that. Okay, now we're going to use the Hexafire, want to fight off of that. Just keep them under control and staggered. And then if things get hairy, throw out the Jet Serpent. Make sure that they're not going to be able to come back in and control the point. Uh, they did a little dance, a little merry-go-round of Do ultimates. Do a little dance. So, yeah. Make a little ult. Get down tonight. Yep. That's accurate representation of what happened, I believe. <laughs> but now Splice, they're the ones on the defense, and they've already lost a lot of ground on this. Moon Chopper, man, being able to follow up nicely where Loki gets the double Ooh. kill. Clicky picking another one up. There's an Ice Storm to actually block this passageway from Moon Chopper, but he sees the Terminus get the last hit necessary to kill him. And Aspects, it's very difficult if you're just alone, Eevee facing off against Renegades right now, waiting for the team to spawn up. But what are they going to do as a unit? 125 left on the clock. Now Splice respawning. They're in a good position to try and hold a defense. But honestly, all you need at this point is maybe a couple kills, and you can roll that payload in. So it's going to be big. I want to know what click is going to do. 92% built on that Hexafire. Should have it up in just a few seconds. The question is whether or not that's going to come out to make the big swing. Splice already used a lot of lockdown from this kind of vantage point that is possible for Renegades through time and space down the middle. But Aspect and G-Bunny both fall. Another Buck Wild as Renegades finish this off. I want to say that I would give that Buck Wild Still a good score as a test for it, because even though it didn't find a ton of kills, that Buck Wild to me was more of a, hey, look at me kind of moment for Moon Chopper than anything else. I don't know if he really needed the ult to do so, but honestly, being able to pop it there, find a couple kills, Loki being able to just kind of remain hidden. No one's looking at him. No one's paying attention to him. He's getting these shots off. He's on a 10 streak. If he can continue that kind of route, that's how you win fights. No 666 stat lines right now for this one, but you still got the streaks going, Loki and Viral at that. I think very typical support stat line. That's what you like to see. And you're starting to get to that point. Some of this itemization, Click You and Moon Chopper, both in that tier three on the Cauterize. And it's 2-2, so no comeback mechanic or anything at all. As Splice, once again, they try to kind of just get this password away to the objective, but aren't stepping onto it just yet. They'd rather put G-Bunny into the face of the enemies. G-Bunny fighting probably where Terminus might be a little weak, but he's going to be able to push people into one building, taking a lot of damage. Power Siphon's going to be worth a lot. Enlightenment gets rid of Loki, nice. and now they're getting aggressive. Renegades, they lose three right now, and Moon Chopper also falls immediately after. So Splice, because of how many they just killed off in quick succession, can step up in this way where they don't even need G-Bunny on the objective right now. He's just waiting to see who pops their head out first. This control so far so good. G-Bunny just waiting patiently on the side. Everyone on Splice looking to hold a different angle to make sure that no one is going to be able to get there. Hero looking to come in. Hexafire going to be coming in as well, but it's a little oh, bit too late. Oh, the nice grip up and everything so that Hero couldn't actually step onto the point. Splice get their third point of the game. And it's up to Renegades to make sure they can't push this through. And now Moon Chopper. I mean, that's just a rough spot to be in. Terminus, Eevee. You can't really win that fight, even with some well-placed headshot. Everything going, not necessarily downhill here for Renegades, but definitely changing pace. Not an uncomfortable spot. Not quite sure what they're feeling, because they threw a lot towards the tail end of that, but did not find anything. It seems like immediately after that capture as well, as Aspect, with the help of the ultimate, picks up the kill on to click you. They really wanted to try and keep this payload from exiting through the doorway, and that's almost like Moon Chopper went so aggressively. But it's so difficult when you don't have all the necessary vision and stuff to know who is waiting for you. As this payload passes the 50% mark, and at the windmill, that's Renegade's best bet on this next portion to hold the defense. G-Bunny aggressive on the side, rotating around, finds two kills to hold for himself through time and space comes down, but that's more zoning than anything else, pushing people back on the side of Renegades. Loki is still someone you have to keep your eyes on. Click you picking up a couple kills there as well. So it's slowing everything down for Splice, but this roster, this lineup, I'm kind of interested to see their drafting in the future because as of right now, they're looking it, dead, as deadly, if not more deadly, than they did last week. Yeah, with the Renegades right there, yes, they got the kills that they needed to be able to hold this, but it came a bit late at the same time, right? Look how far the payload had come, and Splice have enough time to regather themselves. And some ultimates just need a little bit longer on their charge. If they can take that moment, Renegades might have a bit of an issue. 
looking to try and come in for the last collapse. All you have to do, you have 40 seconds to push this payload about 20 feet. It's not going to be too difficult if you can get the right pickup. Scout about to be up, Enlightenment up, and that reanimates. Still not going to be available, so G-Bunny has to be a lot more careful with his health bar. I want to see what this back line can do. There's another Enlightenment followed up. There was a Dreadster from Briar Renegades. They end up losing two players as Leon and Cassie showing out for Splice's back line. It's all on them, right? A double kill for Ricotta. Aspect picks one up with the Ice Storm and Splice tie up the set. So two games in a row now. And I would say pretty good success with four out of five of the champions, one of them being swapped from game one to game two. Good looks in game one, really good looks in game two. I want to know if this Splice roster can do more. Is this Terminus a crutch, or is this Terminus just something they value highly enough that they know it works? And I liked what we were seeing there with the Ricotta play as well as the Shadow play. Oh, yeah. Because Leon and Cassie were doing such a great job of applying that pressure there in the end. But that was game number two, tied up set. Let's go to the desk. Shadow play. <laughs> I don't know why <laughs> alternate's voice just popped up in my head when Gabby said <laughs> It does that every now and again. <laughs> <laughs> love me some, love me some Greggy. Uh, but uh, how do you feel? I mean, do you agree with the casters that this is more of a frontline battle, or, or do you agree with me that this was the boys from Splice kind of doing their thing, the big boys that uh, you know have the potential to carry these games? I'm going to actually say a combination because what really came into play and what you saw Splice doing was they were not just forcing G Bunny into that frontline battle. They wanted to find the damage output first, and then once. Terminus has a little bit of an advantage in the health pool. He can move in and start to contest and start to battle that front line. A much more smart adjustment than what they saw previously. But again, you look at Ricotta, you look at Shadow, and even Aspect that game yeah, had a lot great. of really, really nice shots there onto Eevee to make some plays happen. And, and I mean, when you're looking at a guy like Ricotta, who's known for a lot of aim, very yep. precise character that he's playing, piloting as well. He made some very, very confident plays. I like the way I saw him slide in, use a couple of enlightenments here or there. But just oh not missing God. your shots, that's what Leon is about. All she is is shooting. There's not a lot of utility to it. There's not a lot of uh, outside crowd control or anything. It's about firing off that heirloom rifle and landing. That play right there is actually, again, a kind of iterating the moment of G Bunny's going to move on the right side, kind of clear some space. He's got Ricotta right behind him. That was probably the juiciest enlightenment he's seen in the PPL so far. Three people stacked up, able to take down one and a half, really, as that splash damage came through. But those are the moments. Those are the type of plays you need to be aware of. And for Renegades to adjust, you need to understand that this is what Splice is going to do. We need to stay yeah. a little bit more together, not get ourselves in these enclosed spaces, make them try to fight our frontliners one on one, not in these instances where you can have all this funnel damage come right into three of us because that was how that game at least that point specifically was won for splice there was a lot of uh, sort of lockdown as well and a lot of things to frankly kind of punish the stacking up great ice storms from yeah. aspect as well you know good ice storms i think are a hallmark uh, of a great ev but that does it for game number two it's time to move on in this set we'll take a look at the map screen see where the next map will be it'll be jagfall so a very similar flavor to bright mars we'll have to see what adjustments are made in or out of the draft I'm really interested to see how Splice adapts their draft today as a whole, not just in this game, but as they have they play through their double header. Because so far it's yeah. been very similar drafts uh, through and through, with the exception of really just the Strix and the Leon between the two different games. So Cassie's going to get banned out. This is a different looks and Terminus as well. So RNG is actually going to force Splice to play very differently than they have so far. And that will leave the Mave open first pick. We know Chopper was the one that sort of brought this pick. To the forefront here. Wow. But they take the Shaolin, and whenever I see something like that, it's almost it's almost saying, I dare you to take it. Let's yeah. see if you will. Yeah, right? this absolutely. Is a, this is a best of five. Let's see, how, let's see how they respond. Let's see what they do here. Let's see if they'll take the Maven. And they do. So I'm kind of surprised they didn't take Maven to the Genos, to be completely honest. That, that seemed like kind of the staple of what you should have gone for the f uh, second and third overall picks, because your frontliners, you know, you're going to have Perhaps the ability. It's just yeah. comfortability for G-Bunny. Possibly, though. very possibly. They're worried about him being comfortable, being able to do what he wants to do. Don't get me wrong, I think Anar is f absolutely phenomenal on Jaguar Falls. I've seen, you know, certain, the right wall can net you 20% on the objective outright. They're going to get Buck and Genos this time around. We'll see if that's what Moonchopper needed to kind of push him over the edge to really take over the game with it. Barrick will be hovered and likely locked for Kliku, I would imagine. Yeah. 
I like the Barrack here too, just because again, those turrets can be just a little bit more of a nuisance for Maeve to deal with. But again, you also have a Bomb King for Splice. It's not the biggest issue. And now the solo Barrack into this with the Drogos coming in. It's a lot of damage being funneled out for Renegades in this composition. Very damage heavy. Uh, a lot of chase potential with having the buck. Even the Drogos can get up in the air and find some long distance shots. But the Leon, I like this Leon pick a lot. I was wondering if it would possibly be RNG picking up the Leon to help deal with the Maeve. But this going back to Ricotta, I think. Well, maybe not actually. I'm not sure who's going to play the Maeve. I imagine that Shadow will likely be on the Bomb King, but the guessing game is... I, usually, I, never, I never look good when I start guessing. <laughs> That's kind of <laughs> what makes it fun. Uh, this is the, the type of comp, or the type of draft that I like to see from both teams. Same. So when you ask me who I like, I'm like, uh, kind of looking back and forth, ping-ponging, looking for a weak spot, not really finding what I'm looking for in, in terms of a weak spot in either of these drafts. Uh, I think it really comes down to how the players are going to play, and that always makes for the best type of game. So play style versus play style, so it happens. Let's get into it, guys. Game number three, Renegades versus Splice. Nick looked at compositions where there was a barrack on one and said there's no weak spot or anything. Maybe he's... I feel like Fnatic has run like enough solo barrack where it's just like, well, if you're a good enough team, like it's going to work. But I expect Nick to always find some to way always. to hit on it. It's right there in your face, man. But yeah, I well, think Well, when it comes through and we see that it's actually Architectonics barrack, that's when he's going to come actually breaking through the door, grab a headset, and start yelling like, about Listen, it. I just want to clarify, guys. <laughs> I'm going to retract my statement from earlier. I no. retract all previous yeah. statements. <laughs> I will not be held accountable for things I said when I did not have Full information. All the information that I needed. Hey, you're on Jaguar Falls. I do like Renegades actually bringing the barrack pick within their composition. I'm kind of curious as to how this one's going to work out. Again, Splice kind of forced off some of the things that have been finding them a lot of success, but still grabbing things that I think are usually going to get you success. G Bunny's going to be on Anara. You've got Mave. You've got the Leon Bomb King. And Maldamba's just Maldamba at this point. But everything about their lineup is just strong for them. And the way that Ricotta and Shadow were performing during the last game, and Ricotta is continuing on the same pick from prior as well, then they might be able to, especially with the help of a Bomb King for even more of that damage control, break through Renegades. But Hero, he's the one on this barrack, and he's going to be setting up kind of to make sure he catches off any flank action that may be presenting itself from Splice. Couple of good shots right here. Click, you're gonna get stunned out, but returning now to this buck, and it's something that we've seen him find a lot of success with. A nice shot in the air. Shadow barely escapes through that one. 12%, gonna start climbing back up for Renegades as you take down the Inar, you took down the Leon, and Loki, he is zoned in on this Shaolin, attempting to get some dismounts at this time being, but a couple of them on Splice are waiting for their entry as Renegades are closing in on these side just stairwells. And they've just been playing this fight solidly on the side of Renegades. Again, it's not necessarily about as many kills as they get, as much ground that they get from the damage they throw out. When they pick up kills, it's gonna give them the same amount usually of ground that they would have, maybe a little bit more. But as it is right now, they're just pushing out splice. They don't even have to worry about finding the kills. They just grab the point. It is captured. It is time to push. And because of this position right now, they're continuing to corral Splice where they should be able to make it through the first choke point unless somebody can make their way through. But you see Moonchopper on one angle. You even see Hero on the other setting up his turrets to blockade that opportunity. And Click use back on the buck right outside. So anybody that actually pokes their head out is really going to face off against his shotgun. <laughs> but love the Maeve and the way that she can just kind of jump around and say, look at me. I, you know, I laugh there, but honestly, Clicky, I would have had the exact same reaction of, wait, where'd she go? Where, where is she? I'm supposed to shoot her out of the air. And it was just Shadow again, not necessarily even playing that like, like smart in the way that it was. He didn't get aggressive. He didn't play it dumb in the way things could have gone. Being able to fall back there, just recognizing, you know what? I can't do anything if I get aggressive here. It's not the fight to take. Yeah, and right now, though, Halo taking a little bit of a standby as this is the point where the terrain does work in Splice's favor. Renegades have made all of this progress based on just not even trying to engage too many fights. But here's a Dread Serpent to start off. Moonchopper picks up the kill onto Ricotta, but Clicky takes some damage for himself. The rest of the team on Renegades are ready to constantly zone in on Splice. Aspect actually gets a nice clip from that through time and space. One shot away from death 
and ends up finding it from Hero, even though Moonchopper was ready to secure that if need be. And now the rest of Splice are once again forced backwards. Now with the way these rockets are going for Moonchopper, I'm going to say this has been kind of like a warm-up period. You can kind of see, I want to say, the swing from the other champions he's been playing to where he is right now. The rockets haven't been always 100%, but the ones that are hitting are doing a lot of damage. Loki coming around the side. A lot of poke down. Enlightenment is going to be thrown to the wall. And now a couple of arrows could mean a couple of kills. Mercado was really eager to try to get that kill. Aspect picks it up onto Click You and Moonchopper starting to zone in on this Drogos. And just as say that popped out of the air, even the dome shield from Renegades, that was the last decision to try and push this through before any overtime potential. And with no big tank from Splice to actually stand in front of this objective, they're looking mighty vulnerable as right at the last time Anara makes her way back to it. 10 seconds left. Loki really far behind. Moonchopper's up there as well as Click You. But it doesn't look like it's going to be enough to actually get in there and try and push this forward. A couple of good kills from Splice, as well as a couple of dropped kills from Renegades. There were several times, and I, I'm going to throw Loki under the bus here, even though I don't really mean to. His, his Shaolin has been phenomenal. But there were a lot of arrows at the end there where it's just like, this would be the kill. And Splice were reading him. They were recognizing, he's trying to kill me. He's aiming at me. He's not looking at you. Leon gets aggressive, and Vayne just kind of does this dance where it's like, you are not going to connect any of these arrows flying left and right, but still lives through all the engagements. And it's always a shame when you're so close to actually completing that push. Renegades made so much progress and even used the dome shield in an attempt to close that, but... Instead, it's 1-1 one, one and Splice right now. I think if they try and Aspect needs to get some good play, maybe with a King Bomb or something to disintegrate Renegades. Apex Predator here for Moonchopper is a card, and this has been big on pretty much anyone who has crowd control and slow reduction cards, but not running at a level 5 because you also need like survival 4 just to make sure it's worthwhile, that 40% propel as well at level 3. So a lot of mobility, a lot of movement here, and a lot of survivability for Moonchopper. The question is whether or not it's going to make the big difference. Splice right now are looking to get aggressive. Maybe lock him down. And maybe off of that, but Shadow ends up getting punished despite just not really getting much out of that Midnight. And Inara running low as well. So 39% for Splice, but losing two key players as Renegades continue to apply this pressure. Moonchopper was taken out, but Loki and Hero are here to clean up. Through time and space, nice. Viral throws it out, hits Aspect, almost connects with Vayne, but Vayne's going to dash through. Click you, though, recognizing this. <laughs> Vayne's going to have to slowly but surely figure out where he wants to jump off of the map. And it's one of those really rough instances of it's going to take you a lot of time if you go backwards, if you go forwards, or if you wait for them to actually kill you. No matter what, you're getting staggered out. You can just try to expedite the process by jumping off yourself. He does make it off, but I don't know if it was really as worthwhile. Here comes the punch, and I'm sure there goes Inara. Or not. Couldn't find right at the last minute. So instead, has to take to the air, and in the end, you know what? You don't get the kill, but Splice does back up. He's already at 52%. Yeah. Well, you get that charge back onto it. Now it's already looking pretty good for him. This capture for Renegades. This time, Click You sees the Mave. Last time was a bit more deceptive in where Shadow was, hiding behind the rock to get some heal. The Moon Chopper was from the opposite angle to finish that off. And Aspect right now, just doing out with this Click you right in. It's really hard when you're at that close range. And yes, you're throwing out the bombs and everything, but Renegades had more than one player, right? It ended up not just being this 1v1 where Aspect kind of wanted it to be. And it's also that area of, like, you know, you're in the 1v1 with a buck, yeah. and you watch him recover, and, like, he's just going to stare you down. Like, he can sit there and reload his shotgun. That 40% damage reduction, he's just going to kind of laugh at all the bombs you're throwing out. I'm like, yeah, dude, just keep them coming. I got to reload for a little bit. Oh, there was Neil. Click you does go down to the Enlightenment from Ricotta. So that's one of the streaks that was flying really hard that ended up getting complete. And it's just a little back and forth trade right now, throwing down the Dome Shield hero on the sideline. So as soon as Inara steps into it, takes some damage, but luckily has a lot of ways of keeping that sustained up. Needs to just delay this while the rest of the team respawns. A nice shielding going to be able to come through from the dash, just trying to keep himself alive. Click use low again, but draws a lot of attention to himself. Does end up going down without finding too much value. Loki's back, though. Respawn, maybe a little bit more damage to be able to come from him and potentially turn this around. That was such an aggressive jump in from Click you as well, where, yeah, there was a moment where he was surviving just fine, but got burned down. And there's a whole, at the time, it was, I think, 54 seconds or something. But Renegades, I think, feeling a bit more comfortable with that timeline. It looks like they're also not too worried, even if they don't complete the push. 
They seem like they're okay with it, but just waiting for their prime opening, especially since Dome Shield, Buckwild, and their time and space are all down. Click you taking a lot of damage on the side, finally getting aggressive. Shadow, who's been kind of quiet on the Mave this game, not had a lot of success for too much, I want to say, in terms of play, has been hanging around the side. Beautiful from Viral and Moonchopper to get rid of G Bunny, and that could be the gas pedal. Ten seconds left. Hero does have a little bit of presence to be able to put onto this payload, at least hold it in overtime. Past that overtime, potentially Renegades but they send Hero over to the objective. Shadow does fall, so now it's up to Ricotta to put this onto his shoulders, gets a nice headshot onto Clicky, a second headshot as well, so to counteract that kill that he just got. Another enlightenment, but this one misses right to the left of Moonchopper, who takes to the That's air and takes read. one right in the face in the very end by Ricotta. Shadow is back, and Shadow is ready with a double kill. Finally coming through, but again, a lot of that, I want to say the pressure fell onto Ricotta. There were just some key moments, and I don't want to say he was kind of pressured to do well. I think his team was in a good position, but he was pushing hard for those kills. Six, eight, and six. He hasn't been doing as well this game as we've seen in the past, but the presence he's had for those six kills, or the 12 that he's been a part of, have been incredibly important. That's the thing. It's not always about, hey, how can I pad my stat line as much as possible? It's when I get the kill, how do we capitalize upon it? And... Right now, especially when you have the Maldamba and Nara combo, I think you're expecting for Vayne to pull ahead a bit on the healing charts. Mm -hmm. So matching off against it, but Five, looks like three, a lot of defensive three, items two, brought out by Splice. One. And being able to look at it, Moonchopper, I was kind of curious about it, but you do see Havens coming through, but the Rejuvenates are going to be just as big here, especially with Viral being on Genos, trying to keep them all healed up. Only one Blast Shields, and that's from G-Bunny, because... Admittedly, he's going to be the target for Moonchopper <laughs> nine times out of ten. Oh, for sure. And now it looks like Splice, they're actually fairly grouped together. Renegade seeing if they can find a way to go ahead and punish this. Moonchopper had taken to the opposite side, but luckily with that mobility and gap closing, looks like he's going to land some shots onto Ricotta, who tries to run away even with the grace, but Click you finds him. And this is one of those moments where you could see he was just trying to hold this angle but got really lucky with where Ricotta wanted to move right there. Aspect kind of locked in the corner, finds another click you just clicking on everyone with this shotgun, making sure he's taking them down left and right. Yeah, a double kill for him and just right into the face once more. He's rotating to the same spot he has been immediately after the past captures of Renegades. And it looks like that's exactly what they're going to be getting now. So kind of getting ahead of the curve, especially if Shadow decides to pop his head out at any point. Now Buckwild's charged up. Actually, everything except for Heat Haze on Renegades is charged up. And that could be, again, a key when you're up 3-2. Try and close this out. They've had a lot of difficulty with the tail end of this push. But if you use those ults right and you use them in the, the proper timings, you could keep Splice kind of perpetually knocked back. You just kind of like keep jabbing at them a little bit so they're always retreating. And this has been the same tactic from Renegades during their last push and the previous push even before that. But on both of those, they still lost and weren't able to actually complete it because of the final moments. They always make it right to where it's just a little bit longer, maybe 2 to 8%. But something about the way that Splice was able to hone in with their backline in those moments, and Renegades need to find a way to prevent that. Almost getting a kill. I feel like if you put Shadow down right there, you have a much easier time. But as of right now, Splice are kind of locked in their base. Yeah. No ults have been thrown out on the side of Renegades, but you've got Dome Shield, Buck Wild, a Dragon Punch, and their time and space. A oh. lot of stuff that buys you time. And here's the Midnight Splice. They were locked in for a little too long and want to make their way out. An Aspect with the King Bomb as well gets a kill onto Moonchopper eventually. But this is Renegades coming out on top in this fight. Loki, immediately beyond the actual payload, was able to turn around, get some shots onto the enemy, and Renegades walk away with the victory. Good positioning, good use of ultimates, good, I want to say kind of holding back at the end of, the, or the beginning of that push to make sure that the end of that push was a lot easier, because I feel like that's where Renegades, they started out strong every time, but they would put a lot of effort into that beginning push. 50% easy to attain. Last 50%, that's the hard spot. Well, that was game number three, so Renegades have pulled ahead in the set two to one. Let's send it back to the boys on the desk. One, they're going to pull ahead now. We can look at maybe some of these compositions, break down what you think went right or, or wrong in this matchup. Was it champions for you, or was it more the way the map was played? Map was played, I think, uh, just generally. But that is a product of what champions were picked, you know, at the end sure. of the day. I, I, Splice was getting bodied on map position in that entire game. Yeah, it was close. It was a 2-2 for a lot of it. But look how much map control Renegades had throughout it. They 
won every objective pretty easily, to be completely honest. And they got that push all the way into Splice's base up until the respawn proximity was the only real defending chance that they had. Yeah. They just ended up doing it very well. The big question mark for me just comes down to, you know, how do you let the barracks sit up so, so quickly and let him get himself right. such a solid ground? And beyond that, the Drogos was just out zoning the Bomb King as far as their ability to deal area damage for me. Yeah, I think Bomb King, he really shines once you can get him into and around the objective. Very right? much when, so. When, when Drogos is up on the high ground, just, you know, fire spitting around corners, hitting walls, hitting corners, stuff like that. It's incredibly hard to stop. Uh, I do want to ask you about, about the Buck, though. We've seen Buck, you know, every single game this uh, this series so far yeah. for the Renegades. This time it has the Genos up against roughly the same champions, but Kliku piloting it instead of Moonchopper. What are your thoughts on his, you know, kind of success over that? Is it really just the Genos? I think that's a huge factor that, you know, again, we don't let the supports really shine all that off. We don't call their names, but that is a very big enabler for Kliku. He was able to put out nearly 50k damage simply because, again, of that extra little luminary boost. But, again, the big question mark in that draft was you picked the Mave without picking the Genos with it. And I think that when you look at flank versus flank, you add one more element into kind of like the stockpile of what Buck can bring to the table that Maeve doesn't, and it immediately gives you that early advantage, just having that damage boost where your opponent doesn't. You got to talk about Loki as well. You know, oh, yeah. Saying, Played incredible. incredible. You were talking. Your favorite thing was actually the sound effects. I love I loved the, nerf we the nerf weaponry. Just floop. It's you just, just so take fat. Take and listen, you know? That's five in a row. Just bathe it in. Mm. Breathe it in, chat. Mm. Breathe it in. Bathe in the glory. <laughs> this is actually a great play, though, as well, from Loki. Able to find his way back into the back line. This is really smart positioning. Granted, he's getting a lot of help up front, but being able to slide on back here, it's not only allowing him to hit those last couple of shots, but again, the heat haze there just to make sure nobody comes out of base. It's For just, fun. Yeah, just <laughs> now you see me, now you don't. Love it. Love it. Great stuff from the Renegades across the board. They move ahead 2 1 in this set. One more would claim them the victory. Have to say, it's not been as easy as I thought it was going to be coming in today. Splice are doing a great job putting up an incredible fight. Let's head to the map screen and see where this one will play out. Remember, uh, our bands for this set are going to be Stone Keep and Ascension Peak. So those not in the pool, we're headed to Fish Market. Ready to see some more Strix. 40 PS. <laughs> Is it time? <laughs> Is it time to G2 them? I would be okay with it. Yeah, I mean, you have to anticipate the Strix, I think, at this point. Yep. Does it warrant a ban? I think Frog Isle is really the only map yeah. that we see snipers actually banned on. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't see. Despite it's, them being almost as much of a win condition, <laughs> I would say on on Fish Market. Uh, it's tough to say. I mean, it just comes down to. I mean, Strix on this map, I, I think he's got the more viability when it comes to the two sniper conversation. The problem is he doesn't get as much viability in this map as he does on Frog because there's not a giant wall for him to hide behind that he can peek for free with the stealth and then also get the information yeah. with the flare. These are interesting bands, though, for me. The Maeve makes sense, but then the Eevee and then Cassie bands, we might be forcing ourselves to see more of a point control kind of battle in the trenches game here. And it will be the Terminus banned out for the Renegades again. So hopefully, if not anything else, looking to maybe make Splice a little bit more predictable in the draft. We talked about last time, oh, why are they taking an R here? That's it's a little strange, right? Uh, maybe it's just to keep G Bunny comfortable. And on Makoa, you have to imagine that he's going to remain comfortable. If you're not, like I said, I think I said this yesterday. Yeah. If, if Makoa is not a power pick for your team, you don't belong in the league. Yeah, I think that's actually pretty accurate. And if it is going to be G Bunny and this Makoa, I think this is proving grounds for him flat out. I mean, he's going to have to show up and really show out why Makoa is that priority ban. And I think this might even be our, our Renegades looking at it saying, you know what? Let's force him to play Mako. Yeah. Let's force him to hit some hooks. Let's put the pressure on him. They've been doing a really good job of, I won't say isolating, but at least targeting out G-Bunny and making him feel uncomfortable whenever possible. I mean, I stand by the fact that anytime anyone lets Makoa through in a draft, it's because they have a plan. They know Makoa is getting through. They don't see it locked in. Right. Like, oh no, I can't. We forgot about Makoa. Like at this <laughs> point, it just doesn't happen. So it's about what is that plan? How are you going to play around it? But Khan, the two selected for the Renegades, I think Khan is actually a decent answer for Makoa, being able to spread that CC immunity on yep. demand. I think so too. And then you have the NR as well. The damage reduction that she can hold Mother's Grace is going to be really big. It's going to make life hard for Makoa. He's going to have to find. It's not just he's going to have to find the hooks. He has to pay attention to what abilities are also being used by not just one, but two different champions. He's got to make sure that he's able to hit those. Uh, Strix was lingered over, but then to the Androxus. How do you feel about the Andro just in general, but more specifically on this map? It's up to the player. Yeah. It's up to the player. It's up to Ricotta. It's up to Mutu to be able to make this work. And I think they do wonderfully low-key as well. It's like you get that, that Stone Keep, Serpent Beach, 
Maybe Fish Market. Fish Market, it, it's not a common enough map for me to say confidently sure. like I can around Stone Keep and Serpent Beach, where I, I think it can work. I don't think high ground is hella important here. Uh, but I'm very curious to see how a guy uh, like Rukata is going to be able to make this work. And I think a lot of it comes down to as well, I mean, who is, wow, okay, but the Victor, this is, when was the last time we saw a Victor picked up? It had to have been last fall. Didn't happen at World Championships. I don't believe it happened in the spring. I agree with you. I don't think, yeah. Oh, I mean, console. Unless you're counting console and PPS, yeah. which in the PPL, we're not. No, so, I wasn't. In the least. PPL. <laughs> Renegades, two front lines. Mm. They got the Damba, Buck Leon versus Androxus Victor Shaolin. So, <sighs> you know, Androxus Victor, viability out the window. They do have the DPS, I yes. think, to compete at this level. I think it all comes down to execution, but do you have faith to, to say Splice have drafted themselves a winnable comp here? No. Okay, so we'll add this one to the casters and see whether or not they can pull it out. It is the beyond all of the set, Splice's last opportunity to keep themselves in it. And Victor, once in a while, pops his new fresh face out. It's always like SK. Yeah. Like it's Bitey. Bitey, Bitey. Bitey specifically always team tends to be the one I think I always see going towards Victor. Even either when it's SK games during the spring split or for this one, I've seen a lot in, you know, pugs whenever he happens to be playing. He likes to get that DPS, but Splice running him, I feel like we've seen success from him before. And the things that Victor does, he does well. The problem is, is being able to do that again. One of the things pro players tend to gravitate towards is like the burst. Victor does all of the same damage. It's just a little bit harder to connect with. That's the thing, is the overall DPS capability of Victor alongside Androxus enough to combat the fact that he isn't necessarily in that style of burst. But also, I will like to note, this weapon looks sick. That is a big one. And I still, personally, am keeping it in my head that this is Mr. Old Man Victor's son. I like that. <laughs> that is my favorite storyline for this, the, the new skin, the new hotness that has been coming through. But you can see being able to run this actually going to be the old wolf coming through looking to frag out. Wanting his grenade to be a bit more effective as well, reducing the cook time, making sure you can have some CDR on the grenade, and... Now, actually, a nice little headshot right there, but still has to get zoned in. Click, he's the first one to get the kill onto G Bunny. So, just that frontline action on the objective. Well, so far, the one thing about this matchup I think that's going to be kind of screaming itself out to me is just that con on the side of Renegades. Everything that they are picking up on that side is going to be enabled by that, either in terms of healing, in terms of damage. And for Splice, while you get a lot of really good picks in the process, it's just so difficult to. I want to say displace him and make it a lot harder on Renegades to have a 4v5 because Khan's just unkillable. And frontline on this map for G-Bunny, it is putting a lot of pressure on him to face off against the double frontline on Renegades where you can be so vulnerable. 99% finally gets stemmed a little bit as two have fallen for Renegades. And Splice, they have to take full advantage of this opportunity because eventually they could just get collapsed upon. Get aggressive, take control, try to figure out what you can do right, 99%, but it can be stalled and held there as of right now. Looking to get rid of that shield and kind of keep Click you in check. G-Bunny gets tossed back, but a beautiful shell spin gets him a little bit out of danger, but they're still going to be able to find the kill. Yeah, so Splice still, though, they've rotated with the rest of their team after G-Bunny has fallen, Ooh. and nobody can make it in time from Renegade. So once again, it's them with the first point. And Click you just... That's one of those awkward moments as a frontline because you have to run literally at your death. You know they're going to shoot you. You know you have no choice, but you have to get on the point. Do or die. And now Splice is up 1-0. Oh, the last time they were able to do this, they did keep some good control overall in Bright Marsh. But as of here, Fish Market is a completely different story. Oh, very much so. Just the feel of the map in general. But right now, Splice, even though they captured, it takes a little bit of them to get their footing under them for this push. And Renegades, it's... Looking like, actually, as far as the damage charts go, it is a big battle with Shaolin and Victor pulling ahead for Splice. Being able to do a lot, a lot of poke, but a lot of that, I want to say, isn't necessarily inflated as much as it was. They were trying to kill Click you and they just haven't killed Click you. It's this awkward area of trying to burn down Khan when you can't completely burn him around. I mean, even here, you get maybe a fourth of his health bar down. He peeks around the corner, he shouts, he comes back out, and he's ready to fight again. I just warned Splice has made it around 
that corner of this push. And that's probably a really dangerous area to be where what there's so many opportunities to just get thrown off. But Hero picks one up onto G Bunny. Click you as well. The Frontliners button in that cleanup work as all the ultimates are available if needed. I really love what Aspect is doing. Kind of the positioning, I want to say, of this Victor. A lot that can go right. The grenade can be a show ender, a show stopper, at least, for some of the other people on Renegades. With, it kind of depends on his area of aggression where his team is to follow up on it. Again, his DPS is pretty high. It's just being able to make sure that, that DPS leads into things like kills, being able to actually pick stuff up off the other end of the kills or damage. I'm just taking this far angle, and here's the ultimate coming out. Just only uses a little bit of it. They don't land, so he decides to back off so he can keep 20% of that actual charge on it, but we're in the final 30% here, Seconds and remaining. with the big old targets, you got Hero and Clicky that are just taking a lot of the brunt of the damage, which is why you're seeing all the damage right. It's reflected as well, especially when you're landing headshots like that. But Splice have to find their way over this hill, which can be difficult to do. Especially now you have 15 seconds left. You have what at this point would still be a very long push, a fourth of the way to continue going. And Renegades have a very good defensive composition. Actually, if they could get set up on the point a little faster, I have a feeling Splice would have a little bit more trouble trying to get rid of them on that point. And as of now, that's going to be the pressure enough to get them out and tie it up one to one. I feel like in this whole set, Renegades and Splice, there have been a lot of cases where we don't even go into overtime. They're just okay with recognizing that it would be such a difficult battle for them to get the push successfully that they don't want to take any risks, whether it be using ultimate or handing over more credits to the enemy. G-Bunny at this point right now is 0-4-0. And this is one of those things, you know, really good Terminus games. Pretty good game last game. I can't actually remember off the top of my head who he was playing. But bringing it into this, this Makoa is not looking as polished, I want to say, as some of the others. And granted, in a lot of cases, you're kind of wondering, when are we ever going to actually get to pick Makoa? He gets banned out more often than not. But you're still in this area where you are not having enough of an impact. Even with the extra credits they have, you can see he's opted to go into the Master Riding 1, try to get there a little bit quicker, and now cresting 600. So if he dies, he can get another Tier 2 item, but in this awkward position of just having to fight with two Tier 1s. A nice shot from Shadow forces Buck to jump to the opposite end, but Moon Chopper gets another kill onto G-Bunny. So, oh, 5 and oh at this point in time. And with the front line and the strategy that Splice is taking, it's okay to have a few deaths. You don't have to have the most impressive KDA as a frontliner because he's just been trying to stay as long as possible. And then on his death, someone else rotates. Moon Chopper getting taken out. But there, he just got killed so immediately where the death didn't actually add anything to the team. And again, the glory of Khan uses his ult to just hold him in place. But with the way things are going, normally I would actually argue that the fact that he's dying where he is, it doesn't matter as much because he's been creating a lot of space or opportunities for his team. That case is going to be the rare one, the odd one out, where 20% of the time he's just died and not been able to do much. Vayne Aspect picking up some kills through time and space, gets the snipe, Woo! click you goes down, but they've been able to create a lot of trouble, 66 to 48. A double kill for Splice, but eventually Vayne gets a little punished. Aspect, it's up to him to continue applying this as they start to gain control of this objective, 72% and climbing. Renegades on this map, it's so much more difficult to recover when you have probably like three or four people die at a time. And you know exactly where to look, especially when you're someone like Aspect right now. You don't have to look far to be able to start melting them down, dismounting people wherever you can. Although if you lose G-Bunny here, you've lost Shadow, your damage means a lot to your team. There's going to be the Ancient Rage. On. Is it going to get something right now? Swinging away at Click You, who's taking a lot of damage but able to heal up in the oh meantime. No. Aspect still on this high ground, 99% to 96. Renegades still keeping Hero onto the objective. Aspect and Ricotta end up falling as Loki gets the double kill on this Leon in pursuit of another enemy. Sees that Vayne is attempting to retreat and might even be able to clip him off, but either way, Renegades have captured. Click You played that perfectly in the sense that he made Splice play that not perfectly. He got so low, it was so much tunnel vision in that Ancient Rage, you want to get a kill, you want to have that, that presence with it, that you see G-Bunny, the only frontline for Splice, completely ignore the point. And that's when Renegades just move in. They're like, cool, no one's down here. Now your Shaolin, your Victor, your Genos, like someone that should not be on the point is having to come down here and fight four of us. And it's just that rare area where honestly you needed that Makoa to stay. Even if it feels like a waste of the Ancient Rage, I think it would have been better. I think an underestimation of how long it can take to kill Khan. Yes. And I was hoping, oh, yes. let me try and get this quick kill so then when I do rotate back onto the objective, I have no contest and I can get it for even longer. <laughs> get it? Contest. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
Catching all the little things, Gore. Always got my back. But right now, Renegades is having a bit more success on this push than Splice did previously. About minute and 25 to go as they're continuing to actually pick up a few kills. And that kill from Moonchopper right there, I think is important again to get this payload moving. Getting it up the hill is difficult because they have the high ground. Getting it down the hill is difficult because look, you are literally in a bowl. Damage is easily dumped into you and you just have to be able to make sure that you have something to give you some cover. There's a couple of trees that might lend your favor, but it's the kills on the side that matter and Moonchopper's finding them. And right now, Renegade's up three to one. They're up two to one in the set. So just one point away from taking it all. And Splice, I mean, I think that a lot of it came down to, like you said, there, there in the very end when they were both in the 90 percentile for both of the captures and then just not really being able to focus on where it mattered, which did open up for Loki to get as many kills as he did. And in this kind of instance, all Splice need to do is do what they did last round and they'll have the point. They didn't have to worry about that. It was only because they were on even ground that it made that much trouble for them. Coming into this, they have the comeback mechanic, so it's not Five, anywhere near as four, big a deal. But click you, he has his two, ult. That one. more than likely should mean a death for G-Bunny, either by holding him or shooting him off the map. I expect to be holding him and grabbing him, but either way, Renegades are going to be looking to get that early lead. But with comeback mechanic, they have to play this a lot better. That's true. They have to make sure that they don't leave too much of an opening for Splice to accidentally turn it back on them. Click you with a lot of protection potential and the rest of the team standing behind him in that moment. But Splice have actually chosen to is. rotate in an interesting way. Here's the barrage. Come down. Ricotta picks up a kill on to click you, but Loki is here for the attempted cleanup as two of his members have fallen and it's the frontliners. But G-Bunny's got the ancient rage and once again in pursuit of an enemy, but not going to find anyone. And that's exactly what they needed right there. You get rid of click you. G-Bunny is able to retaliate, and he's at half health. He needs to pop that ult. Whether or not, again, you get something out of it, you stay alive, and your presence matters more than anything. Makoa is still waddling around as happy as can be, and Renegades haven't been able to touch the point for a while. I don't know if they're going to be able to. Maybe. Okay, right now it's 89%. Luckily, they actually rotated, and there's a Dread Serpent from Renegades, but Aspect still picks one up onto Hero. Overtime has begun, and Loki, are you going to get that same impact that you did last time? One shot into the Shaolin, but gets its blow right to the head from the Shadow. Double. And click you, also focusing on G-Bunny. 99% click you. You have to dance around this point. Overtime timer right there just because of his proximity. Going to be able to reset it. But right now, Splice are playing this perfectly. They know you have to be here. They have to pull you out. And G-Bunny's staying alive the entire time, making sure you're in the wrong place. Luckily, Hero was able to rotate just in the nick of time. So click you didn't have to keep backing forth. But off of that couple kills in the favor of Splice, man, that's how they were able to capture. And now I'm starting to see, again, just the progress being made in the game. The changes that you make while you are in the heat of the moment, I think are just as important. Having just one kill from Ricotta come down and save G-Bunny's life has made this round astounding for him in terms of not only his survivability, but his impact and being able to give his team the space they need to grab that point. Up here is the Heat Haze, and there's actually three Renegades right through this little arcway, and I think Shadow is hoping to be able to clean someone off, but not enough of the arrows actually land with them, and Moonchopper, knowing where that was coming from, just managed to turn it around as soon as the Heat Haze was done. About 60% going to regress down to probably around 50% here, maybe a little lower, with a minute and 40 on the clock. So plenty of room for Splice to come back, but they fell back. Hard. They retreated to the hardest line that you could retreat to, and they're still falling back. They're still in danger because now Renegades have moved up, and it's at that area where you don't have enough mobility. Maybe Androxus in a way to kind of sneak past Renegades, and it's going to be very difficult to get someone onto that payload. So you're going to have to win this the good old-fashioned way. It's going to need to be a fight. Yeah, they are indeed so far, and they slowly made their way back towards where they can fight effectively, but it has been just like we said, just a slow way of doing so. And here's an attempt from Ricotta from above with the accursed arm, gets the kill onto Moonchopper as Aspa cleans it up. But with those two just very key players on Renegades down, maybe Splice can actually make some leeway. Aspect going around the side does have Barrage, so honestly, if you're looking to get a couple of big kills, he's going to be the one to potentially find them out, dumping a ton of damage into Inara, which are in this rough spot. The Renegades are grouping up, they're ready to go, and they're going to drop down. 40 seconds left, but Loki is no longer on the board. That makes it a lot more open. And right now, it's in that 30-second range, and there's a little bit of a stop on the payload, but they made it over the hill, which is really, really key, because now they can basically afford to fight directly on top of the payload. 
an aspect, keeping kind of this vantage point just to be able to back off for some cover if need be, as Ricotta and them actually remaining. get a bit more aggressive, but they get punished for it. Loki Moonchopper picking up a couple kills. Clicky now going to be able to stand not only with his own heal about to come up, but also Maldamba making sure that he stays standing and they push back the other three living members of Splice. You're going to have a regroup here, but not anywhere near the time you wanted to. That's going to be a defense. And much like last game, while it doesn't give you the point, you don't get the victory, you're still kind of on the edge of your seat, ready to either win or potentially have this point go wrong. Boom, the lockdown. <laughs> oh, geez. Yeah, and we really aren't seeing a lot of overtime. It's so crazy in those final moments that everyone just says, shh, it's okay. Let's just go <laughs> next round. We'll just go next round. Two to three, 10, seven, five, zero, seven, and eight. So while his slash line really hasn't improved, I want to say G Bunny, again, just being alive there, set up for the team. A couple of shots here. Just, hey, look, I'm Makoa there. And that gives you a little bit more room for Ricotta, a little bit more room for Shadow, some more room for Aspect to come in, get rid of Moonshopper, Viral, Click You, Loki, maybe even Hero in some of those instances when you're actually able to kill Anara. But looking at the main three carries, everywhere else, and this is going to be a good flank to start things off. Uh, and there's actually the luck down. Another ultimate here from yep. Khan to take out G-Bunny immediately at the start of the fight. So Splice are forced to bring some of their most vulnerable people down onto the low ground and then actually back off because of it. And now they're in that position very similar to earlier, but Renegades have to remember they don't have any comeback mechanic. They don't have any enhanced capture, whereas Splice still have half a comeback mechanic. They're going to be getting 4% every other tick that they are on the point. And so they do still have the opportunity to take this away. Renegades have to hold on to control for the full duration of that 100%. But they have definitely made a lot of progress right now, where even if Splice do have a chance to step onto it, then it's okay. There's it through time and space. Ricotta picks it up onto Moonchopper. 90% for Renegades, and Shadows pop the Heat Haze. Makes his rotation around, gets clipped by the Dread Serpent, though, and has to refocus. Where did his targets go? Because in the meantime, they have fallen back. Loki attempt with the Enlightenment, but his targets had just dissipated, and he as well. 90%, and that's a big enough number that honestly you can win a fight, you can come in, sweep it away, but you have to be able to make it there. Click you did not get very close, and I have a feeling the rest of the team is going to be feeling a very similar effect. There's going to be a barrage as well as Ricotta just dumping damage into Anara, trying to hold them back. They have at least one ult. They don't even need it though, because they're going to be able to grab that point. And Splice end up capturing, so it's 3-3 three, three so far. If they push this through, they can push this to a game number five. All they need I mean, at this point, I don't even think it's a little bit of luck. They just need to continue playing the way they have. Their rebounds have been incredible in comparison to what Renegades have been able to do. That beginning fight always seems to swing for Renegades, and then they just lose their footing. They get maybe a little bit too aggressive, or I want to say even underestimating what Splice are able to accomplish, and then forgetting, okay, well, even though they don't have any huge amounts of bursts, it's still going to be able to bring us down if we're not in the right spot. It almost seemed like early on when you use the ultimate to go ahead and get rid of G Bunny and you think, all right, a lot of our work is done. They got so much on the objective at that time. And Splice, though, they've just gained so much ground after the fights that they do actually execute and have been doing a great job of getting rid of Khan and Anarma and Anarma, Inara in close proximity to one another so that then it just leaves everybody else so much more vulnerable and then you really see the squishiness of them. We're at this point. A minute and 20 seconds that Splice can still use to potentially win this and take it to game five. And a minute and 20 seconds for Renegades to hold and try to go back for a point to potentially win this entire set. Splice essentially fighting for their life. Right here, it's not do or die, but it definitely would be better to do than to have to wait and hope <laughs> for another point. And here they are once again where they're right at that bit of the hill. Aspect has been loving these angles that he's been taking and actually getting a decent amount of damage. They just need to actually follow up and kill off Hero when he's in this position. But we see the combination with the Maldamba able to keep Hero so aggressively onto that objective and just shut down Splice's attempt to move forward. Once again, trying to get up this hill. Probably more difficult point. Again, it's just so open for this latter half of the push. And so you have to wait just a little bit longer than I think you would normally want to do on any of the other maps. 
try and open up the ground. No big plays coming out from either side. Click, you're going to be getting aggressive. A nice dash, going to pull Ricotta away, but he's taking a lot of damage to get it done. Yeah, he has to take a moment to recover himself because that's just too much to be able to go in with. And there's a seismic crash. G Bunny picks up the kill onto Viral as two end up falling for Splice. Everybody that is that they do have ultimates available. Click, you, he is in pursuit and actually managing to push back Vayne. Moon Chopper, good with the cleanup. And Renegades, I think they're feeling pretty fine about this defense. Fine about the defense. I'd be more nervous about the offense. They used three ults there yeah. to get that defense. And specifically, Connell is the one that would worry me the most just because it's such a big eliminator. It takes out G-Bunny immediately. It takes out insert any member of Splice here that you want dead at the beginning of the round. And right now, that's been scooped away from you. You have 15%. It's not going to charge anywhere near in time to make a big difference. But you might be able to grab it towards the tail end of the round, maybe towards the tail end of the point capture to make a big sweeping difference. It's hard because you had to use ultimates when you're in that potential game point against the enemy, then you don't really have any excuse. If you lose the game with those ults up, then it's a problem. True. But then you're going into the 3-3 point, so it's tough. And you look at the opposite side where they do have everything up and available. And this was a game that actually was 3-1 in favor of Renegades. Splice had gotten the first capture, and then Renegades got the next three consecutive points. And since then, just haven't been able to close it out for that last one. There's a Dread Serpent, and Shadow has rotated to the opposite end of where a lot of the action has begun as Renegades take to the high ground and the low, keeping themselves together as they rotate. G-Bunny also making basically a full circle around. And I love the way that they've kind of adapted to this. Again, not knowing what they can do with those ults going around the side instead, changing up their attack pattern. But as it is right now, one pluck here is down low. Shotgun Blast oh. going to be coming into the corner. Ricotta is the target. Ricotta is going what? to go down, and this is going to be the point. Either team can pull it, but 30% picked up for Splice. Oh, and you heard the Ancient Rage pop off as well. 33% in Renegades. They need to make their way onto it eventually, but there's a couple frontliners that are duking it out on the objective with Anara facing off finally, helping to take down G-Bunny. A double kill for Anara, and Moon Chopper is just there to say, I got you, rock girl. I'm going to help clean this up for you. Now being able to set this up, Vayne has through time and space. He knows they're all on the point. That could be an ult to reopen this, and that's something you really need. Splice are in this area where you have to come right through here. You're going to get yeah. seen as you wander towards the point. You're going to get dismounted. The question is, how well can you survive it? And when you can't make it to the point, that's a problem. G-Bunny dies before he can even get any foot onto this, so Renegades close it out for the set. Almost, I want to say, what they needed on Splice. It was so close, and again, it was just Renegades saying they expect us to go over here. This is where we've been fighting all game. We change up that pattern at the tail end. We don't have some of the ults that we've been using to win, so we have to play this differently, and it works out. It's very difficult when you know the enemy team is making their impact on the capture and you just want to get to it, but on this map yeah. you get punished so much for trying to make it from the actual base. But this is our first set of the day. Renegade's feeling pretty good after that victory. So let's send it back to the desk. Certainly a valiant effort there from Splice, but unable to bring it out. And I have to say, I I'm a little surprised, quite frankly, with the amount of ultimate advantage they had going into that final round. I'm quite surprised to see them not be able to pull it out. Uh, you called it, though. I mean, it was a Dread Serpent. It was a Barrage. It was an Accursed Arm. Neither of those three really have that Insta advantage. Right. I mean, Barrage was used to try to get Buck to shrug him off. Didn't really go so well. Dread Serpent was used early. There wasn't damage there to convert the kill. A cursed arm again. One of those things. People just ran around corners. Uh, the biggest thing for me was you know the Bakoa went through, had a non non issue in the game. Androxus was picked early, had a non issue in the game. You know it was the backpack of Aspect and Shadow trying to pull that through. It really did feel like at times it was a two on five. And, th and those two were so far out in front on the damage charts. I think the last time I saw the charts, uh, Aspect was at 160. Almost Almost 170,000, yeah. which was about 30, 40,000 above Shadow, who was at 120 ish. Exactly. <laughs> it was incredible performance there, but Splice unable to eke it out. Congratulations to the Renegades, but Splice, your day is far from over. You've got another one here against G2. That'll be our next set of the day. And an incredible performance from the Renegades, though. They managed to bring that back with very little ultimate advantage. Yeah. Now we can talk about how they were able to pull that off. They had really great ultimates. Thankfully, you know, Overpower comes up late in the round, and that's just a free kill on the G-Bunny to send him into Owen 32. <laughs>
feels bad, man. <laughs> no, I mean, you got to give some love out, I think, to uh, to Shadow and Aspect, obviously, who did the damage. But on the opposite side, Moonchopper was really, really smart about the opportunities to take. I know I, I you probably had the same experience. In Ranked, where you're playing a flanker, and there's one damage dealer going off, and everyone's yelling at you, right. why won't you kill the victor? Yeah. Get the victor. Sometimes you don't have to. You have to find those in, those other instances where you can have a proper impact. And Moonchopper played, I won't say super aggressively or super passively. He just played really smart. He played really kind of in that middle ground of, all right, I can help out my teammate here. I can get the damage boost from my con this way. He didn't really overextend at any point in time, which is a lot of the reason why they were able to stay in these fights against that big damage combo of Shadow and Aspect. Perhaps it was a, a byproduct of the, the kind of maybe struggle bus he was riding with Buck in the early games of this set. Finally realized, you know what, maybe this isn't the way I go about this. I'm going to just sort of float and, and be helpful to my team. There's a lot of different ways to play Buck. I think that's yeah. part of the reason why he's so strong. Very basic character. It's not very fancy what he does, but he just does it so well, yep. and you can apply what he does to so many different scenarios in many different ways. But that does it for this set, guys. Like we mentioned, Splice will have another one up against G2. However, we are going to throw it to a quick break, switch out some casters, some death faces, and we'll be right back for set number two.